Go to Romans chapter 10. I've been blessed this morning. I got myself a speaker's water right there. See, that, that's what happens as a preacher right there. Get a few minutes, you preach the word, and all of a sudden you get speaker's water. So I, I want to thank, uh, it's not holy water or anything right there, but uh, it does help the throat. And uh, I want to thank the church for your gratefulness there, just uh, taking care of Michelle and I. I'm so grateful to be uh, just a member of the church, just to preach, uh, to be a disciple. I love you guys with all my heart. Uh, I know we, we, we go through some uh, tough principles, and I, you know, dare we say I, I, I preach some time, and I, and I share some things that are tough, but it's not because I'm down on you. I love you guys. You're my family. You, you, you are awesome. You, you are the people God has chosen. We're going to do this together. And uh, we are a family. Amen? We are a family. Well, uh, hopefully you're excited about the announcements. Uh, I love to hear Martin Scott do the announcements. Uh, in fact, today is his spiritual birthday right there. So, uh, I, I don't know how long it is. 5, 10, 15, 20 years, bro. Too long, okay. It's, it's too long. And uh, yet, you know, in the kingdom is never too long. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we've been right in the middle of a study on First and Second Samuel. We're going to look at this scripture before we dig on in. In Romans chapter 10, it says this here in verse 17. It says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard. Through the word of Christ. Amen. This scripture teaches you don't get faith from science. You don't get faith from history. You don't get faith from intellectual belief. You don't get faith from experience. You don't get faith from how you feel. You get faith from the word of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe he, he lived and died and he is the source of eternal hope. We believe you've got to be made into a disciple and baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you are saved in the waters of baptism through faith. If you are with me here, through faith. And you, in, you, you encounter that, that, that faith in the waters of baptism. You're raised to a new life. And then, as Jesus was raised to a life, new life, you can live a new life in the Lord right there. We believe in the word of God. Amen? In John chapter 17, verse 17, the Bible teaches the word of God is true. Yes. It teaches the word of God is truth. It doesn't teach the word of God is truth for some people. It doesn't teach the word of God is truth for the Nigerians. The word of God is truth. For the English. No. The word of God is truth. Period. It is the truth. There is no other truth. Other than the word of God. And our Jesus Christ is God. You guys with me there? We ended 1 Samuel. If you turn over to chapter 18. We ended with. The story of David and Goliath. And that's not a story of Maria Hart taking out Michael Hart. That, that's not that at all. It's a, it's a story of, I, I like to say, a major upset. Any sports fans in the house? <laughs> and uh, it, it always moves you when there's a major upset. And uh, I, I think about 1980 when the U.S. pulled off a win against Russia 4-3 on a, uh, it was a hockey, hockey match right there. Of course, it was called a miracle on ice. Uh, and it was a miracle because it was a major upset. Uh, I think about 2004 when Greece wins the Euro 2004 after knocking off France, yeah. Czech Republic, they go on to beat Ronaldo 1-0 right there, 1-0. That was a major upset. Uh, I think about being here in, in London when uh, I think it was Bayern Munich 2012, uh, Chelsea beating uh, Bayern Munich 2012 on a penalty kick. You guys remember that? Yuri yeah. remembers that right there. He, he remembers that right there. I see the scowl on his face right there. Uh, and yet, if you're American uh, or, or if you're a boxing fan, you remember uh, Mike Tyson right there. And I'll never forget when he fought a journeyman, a guy he was supposed to be just practicing with, Buster Douglas. And of course, he gets knocked out by Buster Douglas. It was a major upset. And that spurred all kinds of Mike Tyson jokes. He's not here, so I'll tell one. Why did Mike Tyson break up with his girlfriend? Irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable. Ask the person next to you to explain that one. Uh, what did Mike Tyson say to Vincent Van Gogh? You gonna eat that? 
<laughs> Ask the person in front to tell you what that one means right there. You guys with me this morning? Yes, we are. That one out? Yeah, you're with me now, right? Okay, we're in 1 Samuel in chapter 18. We remember uh, David has conquered Goliath. And our last sermon was, was entitled Faith Conquers Giants. Faith in God. Yes. You, you, God plus one is the majority. Yeah. Faith in God will conquer any giant. Yeah. And of course in the church, we, we've got miracles to celebrate. We remember our sister who was living a background, a, a lifestyle where she was living, uh, dare we say, the homosexual lifestyle. Put her faith in the Bible. Lauren got baptized. And she's a, she's a sold out disciple today. We, we see the faith that's happened in the church with, with uh, you know, Carlos Vargas is living here, Steve Fraser. He, he's here. Where, where is Steve? He's here. He, he's a sold out disciple. He's not in Madrid anymore. He put his faith in the word of God and said, I'm, rem- I'm moving to be with London. He and his lovely wife, they are here today. Amen? Amen. We've got to keep celebrating the miracles. And yet there was a celebration with David overcoming Goliath. Question's got to be asked, what does Goliath mean? Because today's sermon is Faith Conquers Giants, part two. Amen. Part two. Because you don't just conquer Goliath one time. You conquer Goliath a lot of different times. And you see that through the heart of David. Now, first of all, we, we've got to ask ourselves again what the name Goliath means. In Hebrew, Goliath means to denude. To denude. Or a reviler. Someone who's angry. Someone who reviles God. But it means to denude. And that's exactly what the enemies of God would do to the Israelites, to the Christians. They would denude them. They would strip them of all their clothing and take them into captivity. And so we may understand just by the name, because the Bible teaches you a lot just through the names that are in the Bible. Goliath meaning to denude, uh, its, its technical meaning is to denude, to strip, to shame, to disgrace, to lead into captivity. And so Goliath will denude you. Goliath will strip you. Goliath will lead you into captivity if you are not careful and don't have faith to overcome that Goliath, faith in the word of God. The Philistines would strip you and carry you into captivity. We know that David overcame Goliath. And yet we've got to ask ourselves, has Goliath stripped us of our faith and and taken us into captivity? Is the world stripping you of your faith and taking you into captivity? Is sensual lust. Is su- All these different things can strip you of your faith that the word of God is the word of God and take you into captivity and they become a Goliath for your life. Let's actually look at something that is very powerful. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21. Since I know you guys have studied out First and 2 Samuel and you know all the insights. We remember how many stones that David picked up when he was going to take on Goliath. How many? Five. Five. Come on, Nick. He picked up five stones. <laughs> Nick Giorgio is at least with me. <laughs> Go on, bro. He picked up five stones because there were five Goliaths that David had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and Goliath had brothers. And you know what brothers do? They hang out together. Yeah. Uh, and so when you look at the number five in the Bible, five is the number in the Bible that represents God's favor. Five is a number in the Bible that represents God's goodness. Five in the, in, in, as a number in the Bible represents God's grace. And so, so David picked up those five stones and he, he, he had God's favor. <laughs> David picked up those five stones, he had God's goodness. David picked up those five stones, he had God's grace. Yes. And of course, he overcame Goliath. But we understand that Goliath wants to strip you and take you into captivity. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, we'll find those other five Goliaths that David had to deal with. And we're going to fast forward roughly about 10, 12 years into his, about a middle-aged man at this particular time. And if you look at 2 Samuel 21, we'll pick it up in verse 15. We're going to see all the other Goliaths that David had to deal with as we get back into our study. It says this, Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines, the enemies of God, and Israel, the Christians. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. Okay, see, now he's a little bit older in life. And fighting the battle for the Christian faith, David got what? Exhausted. Doesn't say he got tired. No, he got exhausted. 
And of course, we know in the church, they're sold out. And then they're sold out with kids. Come on now. Those are two different Christians. <laughs> there's being sold out as a single where all you got to take care of is yourself. And then there's being sold out with kids. There's all that faith you got to have to follow that man of God. Amen, sisters. There's all that faith you got to have to lead that woman of God. Amen, brothers. <laughs> David got exhausted. And yet the Bible says he got tired. But, you know, he didn't let his old age steal his faith in a way that allowed Goliath to take him on out. He got the help he needed and became the incredible hero of faith that we follow. It says this. After he became exhausted, it says in verse 16, it says, And Ishbinah, that's the Goliath, that's one of Goliath's brothers. Ishbinah, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels, and who was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle. So the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. And the church said, Amen. This Goliath is called Ishbi Banah. And yet we, I know, interesting name. We're going to find out what it means in just a moment. But these Goliaths were all brothers, and and David had to face this Goliath later on in life. He didn't just overcome Goliath at a young man's age, and then then there were no more Goliaths. This one is later on in life where David got exhausted. The Bible makes it very clear. He needed help to overcome this Goliath. He needed someone else to come into his life and help him right there. Something we are all really good at doing. Asking for help, right? <laughs> we we want help to overcome our challenge. We don't want we, we don't believe in self help. Okay, and if you get sucked into that too much, you, you will be alone, depressed, and figuring out your life by yourself. And you you need God. You need people in your life. If the man after God's own heart needed people in his life, you need people in your life. Right here, just very clear. He gets exhausted, and then the Bible just says, uh, Abishai comes to his aid. Uh, they overcome Goliath. And, and then the brother said, listen, bro, you, you're a little bit older in the faith right here. Uh, we, we are younger. We're going to go out and do the work of the Lord. We don't have kids. We don't have problems. We, 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 we got to protect you right here. And, and we are going to be the young men and women of God. And all the campus and the singles and the teens said amen. Okay. Ishbibana. Uh, interesting name. It means my dwelling is on the heights. This Goliath, his name means my dwelling is on the heights. My dwelling is on the high places. In the Bible, you'll find the Israelites had got sucked into this type of worship. And you'll find enemies of God got sucked into worshiping on the high places. That's where all the pagan gods were. That's where they did all kinds of wicked things up there. Homosexuality, doing drugs. There are even individuals that believe the term getting high comes from going to these high places and doing wicked things in the name of getting close to God. And so Ishbibanab means my dwelling is on high, high places. And there's only one thing that hangs out on high, pride. (laughs) Pride, only conquered by humility. Ishbibanab represents the Goliath pride that's in this world right now. Ishbibanab represents your own pride that can really steal your faith and conquer you if you let it. Pride is only conquered by humility. Amen. This scripture here shows that Abishai is the guy who gets in there. And of course you say, well, what's Abishai mean? Abishai's name means the gift of grace. Amen. The gift of God's grace. Isn't God's grace a gift? Yeah. Yes. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Is God's grace still Amazing. Yes. See, sometimes the disciples you get a little older, and and, and his his grace is amazing in the beginning. But you hear Ashley share God's grace stopped being amazing. Yeah. And we're so grateful that young man is back. He is awesome. His sharing, his he's even quite handsome right there. Amen. Yeah. Awesome. You need some handsome disciples in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Pride overestimates yourself and underestimates everybody else. This is this is this is bad. Uh, now let's go back to David being tired. You know I'm so fired up that Renee, our brother, is here today. I, I, I mean, 
He came in last night right there. He's got all of his stuff. I mean, they've overcome challenge after challenge. His wife's family is there in Amsterdam. He saw the church just 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 whittle down the convictions to a nub, to nothing, and then he's just dying in his faith right there, and he gets exhausted and tired. He goes, but the, I know I know the Lord is with me, and I, I'll never forget going going with, with, with Renee in the middle of uh, Amsterdam and, and just having a great talk, and, and Renee just says, I, I just got so tired. I, I thought the Lord wasn't just, just going to leave me here. Th- thank you for coming. Thank you for God's grace. I, I cried. I just wow. This this man is accomplished. He's a mathematician. He he is educated. He is awesome, and he's in actually pretty good pretty good shape. I mean, he rides his bike everywhere. And, and you, you probably get you may get hurt here in London, so be careful right here. There, it's not it's not Amsterdam. Um, here's a man who's overcome Goliath. He hasn't he hasn't let he hasn't gotten so tired to do the will of God. And yet you have those that are out there that have gotten too tired of evangelism, too tired of sacrifice, too tired to move to be with a soul out church. And yet you see his faith overcoming this Goliath. His wife's going to be here next weekend or next Wednesday, and it's going to change the church. I'm so fired up you're here today, brother. Thank you so much for your love and your faith. Uh, It's people now. Back to this one here. Brian, Um, I want to talk to the singles. You know, the thing about being a single is you're the only one you think about. You know, because it's just you. You wake up and it's you. You walk out of the house and it's just you. You got to get dressed. You think about your contribution. You think about your hunger. You think about what you are going to wear. You think about how you are feeling. You think about who you think you should date. You think about who you think you who, who's good enough for you. You, 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 you. And let me tell you something. If there's one thing that hit my heart as a single disciple is my incredibly overweening pride. Dominating who I thought I was supposed to marry, what I was, I just, I got, and it it conquered me. We've got to make sure that the singles are not conquered by Ishbi Banap. That you, you, you're humble. You let other people come into your life as David only overcame by letting other people get in his life right there. As a single, do you believe you need other people to influence your life? To in, I'm talking about disciples, sold out disciples. Yes. To influence how you think. To influence where you live. To influence who you date and who you marry. Come on. It could be that they have a more objective view about what would be best for you. I'll say it again. Yeah. It could be that they may have a more objective view about what may be best for you. Yes. Uh, I challenge you to follow my example as I follow Christ. I let people into my life and they went, hey, no, Michael. That woman over there, she's really intelligent and smarter than you and all that, this kind of stuff. Uh, you probably, uh, you better hurry up and uh, go on some dates with her or you're going to be weeping and gnashing your teeth someday. And after I got over my pride and came down off my high place, uh, then I was able to go, the scales fell off my eyes and then I went, oh my goodness, this, this, is, this is God's grace. This is God's grace. And it was God's grace that helped me overcome the Goliath of being selfish as a single. Let's look at the other Goliaths. Yes. These are all brothers of David. We don't want to overestimate ourselves. No. Uh, it says this here, verse 18. In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Sabakai, the Hushite, killed Saph, one of the descendants of Rapha. This next guy is called Saph. Saph means two-faced. You got a two-faced giant you got to overcome. Two-faced. He denotes duplicity. He denotes double-mindedness. He denotes Mr. Spiritual at church, Mr. Flesh at home. This this, this is the double-minded disciple. This is the double-minded individual. His name is the opposite of sincerity. And it says right here that Sabakai the Hushite killed Sack. Sabakai. What does Sabakai mean? We're just digging on in today. Sabakai means corpse-like. Sabakai means to be dead. 
You know what I mean? You know how churches you go into and nobody's singing? It's like corpse-like. Dead. You know how you, you know, just a dead fellowship? Corpse-like. That, that, that's Sabaka. What the Holy Spirit is telling us is the only way you're going to fight off being double-minded, which is hypocrisy, is dying to yourself. Putting to death you so that you can overcome this Goliath. Let's look at the next one. But oh no, I gotta talk to the teens. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, if there's one group that can have the double the, the, the double life, I know I led team ministry. It's our young people. You're singing amen at church, but then at school. You got everything else going on in your heart and in your mind and you're pleasing people and living a double life. This is not the way to overcome Goliaths. You cannot be one way at church and another way at home. This goes for all of us. But but we've really got to go after our young people. It's not okay to be a young person and to live a double life. It's not awesome. It's not godly. And you can overcome that Goliath by making sure your faith is in the word of God and that you just die to yourself. Become just die to yourself and stop get getting sucked into the peer pressure. If you die to yourself, you can fight off being double minded. Let's look at the next one. Verse 19. In another battle with the Philistines of Gob, Elena, son of Jer, Ogram, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear like who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Now this guy's name isn't mentioned here, so we gotta go find his name. Turn to first Chronicles chapter 20. Chronicles is a it chronicles the life of David in first and second Samuel as well. So let's find his name in verse five of first Chronicles chapter twenty. It says this in another battle with the Philistines, Ilana, son of Jer, killed Lami. His name is Lami, not Yami, amen. <laughs> Yami's gonna preach the word today. Amen. But it said, uh, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath. The Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Lami means full of food. Lami means being fat. Full of food. Turn back to 1 Samuel. David needed Elani, God's grace, to overcome this one. Because his name means God's grace as well. Um, I want to talk to everybody on this one. Are you overweight? Are you eating too much? Are you getting depressed and getting a scone? Are you getting down and then going and getting yourself something to eat when nobody's around? Are you getting sad and then putting more on your food and going, now I'm glad? Are you overeating? Are you indulging in food? Food is the God for some people. They overeat. I want to I want to challenge you to weigh yourself and look at what your weight should be for your age and for your height and then ask yourself a serious question. Am I overcoming Goliath? Am I overeating? Am I too full of food? There are countries that don't have the abilities that we have. There are countries that just yearn just to have half of what we eat. Yeah. If there's one thing that I see in America every time I go back is the plates are three or four times the size they should be. Yeah. You order one meal and it's enough to feed the campus ministry. <laughs> <laughs> That's huge. And yet Lami means being full of food. As disciples, it is wrong to overeat. As disciples, it's wrong to just, just it's greed. It's not righteous. And I know, I know this doesn't, it isn't the most, like, well, bro, can't you just say some other stuff? We, we need to be godly. Yeah. We need to exercise. Yes. You need to be, be healthy. You, you, how come nobody's dating me? Are you healthy? <laughs> Look how awesome I am. Brothers and sisters. We, we just got to talk about it, guys. Yeah. We think about it, and then you let that glass get you depressed. When you overweight, wait, you get depressed, you get down. You sit back in the room, you don't tell anybody, you don't get open about it. You start beating up on yourself, you get depressed, and you're like, oh my goodness. And then you start doing foolish things. Yeah. 
You let your mind take over and you don't let the scriptures take over. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. It only takes three weeks to to, to make a habit. Only takes three weeks to make a habit, to cut the sugars. Just just, just to really be a healthy person individual. My family, people say, oh my, you just work out, you, you exercise is just about you. No. Everyone in my family has sugar diabetes. Everyone. I was there at the hospital when the, the doctor said, hey, to my mother, hey, you need to start doing what your son is doing or you're, you're going to die. And my mom died. Because she was conquered by Lami. Full of food. And she had other things there, but she, she, she loved her food. <laughs> And we cannot be godly and overeat. You guys still with me here? Yeah. You're back in 2 Samuel? Let's look at these last couple of glass and then move on. It says in verse 20 of 2 Samuel chapter 21, it says, in still another battle, which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each of his hands. He'd be a little weird right there. Six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He also was descendant of Rapha, when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four were descendants of Rapha and Gath. And that's where Goliath was from. They were the, uh, Goliath's brothers. And they fell at the hands of David and his men. Now this guy's a six-fingered man. He has no name. However, there's insight that can be derived. The number six denotes sin. It denotes missing the mark. It denotes that which is ungodly. Of course, you hear all the conspiracy theorists talk about 666. It just means sin. <laughs> don't, don't worry. What is 666? Oh, it's sin. That's what it is. And his name isn't mentioned, but the number is. And we can learn that six is the grip of sin on your life. The walk to sin. The feet quick to rush into sin. The hand that's got his hand on sin right here. And this can really take you out. Of course, Greed. Greed. This could be a Goliath that can get us. It could be something. We, we got our hands on stuff in this world. And this is one of the reasons I'm excited about our 20 times mission contribution. Because it always surfaces greed. Even in me who reads these scribes. Man, I got a brother. I said, bro, I'm, I'm going to bring a jacket for you maybe on a Sunday. Brother goes, bro, you, you got a few jackets in your closet. You got a few. And I went, my heart just went, oh yeah, I do. <laughs> just, just greed is so easy to kind of slip into. You can get greedy. You can let the six-finger man just have a grip on you. You can let the six-finger man help you. You're just greedy. You're rushing to sin right there. Uh, whatever that may be. This here is the, 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 the sin that the world can really struggle with. Just being greedy for stuff. iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, i4, i5, i6, i7, i paid. You paying for all of it. <laughs> How smart does the phone need to be? <laughs> The thing can take pictures, upload Facebook, do waterproof. I mean, it's just the phone. I lost my phone. I didn't get depressed. I didn't have my hand gripped to it, so I lost it. And, and then it hit me. You know, all I, and they were asking me all these questions. Do you need it to do this? Do you need it to do that? What type of technology are you looking for? Are you looking for it to do this and do that? I got over one. I go, I just need it to call my brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. I just need a phone, please. Just give me, if I went down to the CEX exchange and got a used phone, I'm good to go right there. I'm good to go. Does sin have its grip on you? Are your feet quick to rush into sin? That's the six finger man you got to conquer. Amen. Faith conquers Goliath. Back to 1 Samuel chapter 18. It says this in verse 1. After David finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David. Because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even the sword and bow and his belt. you got to realize, there were only two swords in the land. Jonathan gave his to David. He just gave it, gave up. And Jonathan was Saul's son. The next guy to be in leadership. Jonathan wasn't selfishly ambitious. Jonathan just says, nothing matters. My, my tunic, my, my jacket. This wasn't just an act. These were acts of submission. And David was younger than him. He was much younger than him. And for Jonathan, the only, not, nothing really mattered. He didn't let anything take him out. But I got him in the end. We'll get there as we study it on out. But da- Jonathan's 
soul was knit with David, not split with David. Is your soul split or knit with the men of God, the women of God? Do you find it hard to get close to the sister who's always praying or always quoting a scripture? So spiritual. And you can actually get a negative spirit. toward. That's what was told to me. When people get in my... Ah, Michael, he's so... He's just so... I don't know. He just, he just goes by that Bible. Too, too, too biblical. Too, too... You see what I mean? Yeah. Our soul has to be knit with the brothers and sisters who are, who are walking with the Lord, not split. Amen. Verse 5 says, Whenever Saul, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it successfully. That Saul gave him high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs. With tambourines and lutes. Uh oh. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They've credited David with 10,000, he thought. But me with only 1,000. What more can he get but the kingdom? You know, I long for the day where we get a young man who's so cranky that I can go, you know what? This guy needs to leave the London church. Amen. Amen. I long for that day. Amen. I long for that day Amen. where I can go, this guy, if I'm taken out, this guy can lead God's people. Yeah. This guy can lead God's people. This woman will stand in the gap for Jesus Christ. Not for the movement, for Jesus Christ. Amen. She loves God that much. I long for that day. Amen. Right here, it just says, Verse 9 says, from that time, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in the house while David was playing the harp, as usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Isn't this scary? He gets jealous and I'll... An evil spirit from God comes on him. We think evil spirits are from the devil. I mean, they are, they're satanic. But God sent an evil spirit on him. Isn't that scary? Yeah. Jealousy led to an evil spirit coming on him. Bitterness, anger, jealousy. And this was something that really ate at Saul for the rest of the I mean, he just lost his faith in God and was taken out now what's very interesting about this is it just says David some interesting things about David that we learn we know he, he conquered Goliath but of course now he's got Saul to deal with but it just says uh, in verse 10 an evil spirit from the Lord came forcefully on the house while David was playing the harp as he usually did there's some things that make it very clear as to how David conquered all the Goliaths in his life. Number one, he meditated on the word of God. Psalms chapter 119, that's David. Psalms 119 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Psychology? Science? Age? Liberalism? Just get... By living according to the word of God. That's how you keep yourself pure. That's how you don't desire the sinful nature. By living by the Spirit, the Word of God. David overcame Goliath because he had the Bible in his life and he lived it. The other thing that David... David had godly music. You see that there? David played the harp. David, David overcame Goliath with godly music. My wife laughs at me all the time. She sees me on a Sunday. I got my headphones on. I'm over there. Every now and then she'll see me start breaking down in tears and everything. What is my husband doing over there? And I got that. I got my soul. I got. I just that music just ministering to my soul. Amen. Music is one of the most powerful forces on the face of the earth. Music was created by God. Music sends people to hell. Songs are written about sin, and they sound so awesome. Yeah. And you're like, wow, this is whoa, no, this is satanic. Yeah. You're like, I got my eyes on you. Yo, well, hold on. You're everything I need. Yes. A man or a woman isn't everything I need. That's right. 
God is all I need. Do you have godly music in your life? You listen to me. Some of you just need to listen to some music. You just need to go. You just need to go and just just get get your your harp, your modern day harp. Get your get your iPhone or whatever, your iPad, whatever you do, and you and you get you some godly music to overcome. All the, just, just to get it, just sit in a corner. I got songs I listen to. There's this one song that goes, uh, it's by a group called Acapella. It goes, God gave him who had no sin so that we might become his righteousness. You hear that when you're not very righteous? <laughs> and you go, <laughs> I'm going to play it again. <laughs> Just soft as my heart. Okay, I'm ready to go. I played some godly music. Amen. I've had to get rid of godless music. I've gone through and I went, dang, that song is bad. Yeah. Delete, 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 delete. Oh my god, I'm in sin. A lot of people are walking around listening to sin. Yeah. They got the, you see it in London. They got the headphones on, listening to the devil. Listening to the devil. And you wonder why you cannot overcome Goliath. Do you have godly music? David had godly music. He had that, 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 that heart. Everybody else is stressing out, and he's listening to godly music. There's something that godly music does to your soul. There's a song by that says, Never should have made it. Never should have made it. Never should have made it. That song moves my heart because I, I never should have made it. Never should have made it. But I made it. Amen. I'm here. Yes. I made it. Amen. That's you. You, you, you never should have made it. But you made it. You became a disciple. Amen. You became a disciple. You look at Kari. Kari's got that little, yeah. I never should have made it. <laughs> but I made it. <laughs> and I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. Godly music helps you. Overcome Goliath. And lastly, I mean, David just was a good fighter. Yeah. He, could, he could fight. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to be a, you got to fight. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get mad yeah. at the devil. Yeah. Anger is not sin. Yeah. Anger is not sin. I do not get a sense that Jesus was very happy, very loving and godly little, little happy little baby, little <laughs> sweet little Jesus when he overturned those tables. Oh, he was ticked. At what Satan had did to God's people. Some of you don't get mad enough. You got to get mad at the devil. You got to get a righteous anger and fight for your relationship with God. Fight for the movement. Fight for people's souls. Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sisters. You got to fight. You got to be a fighter. David was a fighter. This is the heart of God. The man after God's own heart was a fighter. Brothers got to be fighters. Sisters got to be fighters. You got to be a fighter. The Christian walk is a fight. It's a battle. I got bullied when I was growing up. I did. And they would, this, this bully would say, oh, these are your mama jokes. That was what was cool back in my day. You know, your mama's so dumb, she brought all her CDs to a traffic jam. <laughs> CDs, traffic jam. This bully had been bullying me, saying all these negative things. Everybody was laughing at me in class. Uh, I, I had... Not so good hair. I had a little afro that was kind of misplaced. And just was not very godly. Uh, then my mom thought she'd help me out, gave me a jerry curl. So I had these curls coming down, grease on my. It was just wrong before the Lord Jesus. I haven't found a scripture, but I know it's bad. And I was in class, and this, this she just kept taunting me and teasing me, and, and or you know just messing with me, and then finally slapped me. I slapped back. Slap me again. I slap back. Slap me again. I slap back. We're fighting. And after that last slap, walked away. And that's the last time that girl ever ever bullied me. It was girl. My girl, no. Her name was Becky. We're Facebook friends still. We were nice little guys. You remember that we got in that fight? She goes, yeah, I remember. You slapped me. I go, yeah. <laughs> you got to be a fighter, man. You got to fight for your relationship with God. Yeah. Are you, do you fight for your relationship with God? You just take it out easy. Oh, the train. I couldn't come. Oh, the train. 
we, we, we got to be fighters. David was a fighter. And he was skilled. You got to be skilled to overcome Goliath. Turn to uh, Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. You guys still with me here? Yes. It says this in uh You know, David threw that slung, he slung that uh, stone in one shot. <laughs> and the Bible just says it sank so deep into his head. Why was that? He was skilled. In Judges chapter 20, look at this nugget here. You need to be skilled with your Bible. Verse 16, among all the soldiers, there were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, each whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Wow. Wow. Mm. <laughs> wow. Boom, you're, you're done. <laughs> and again, we remember David in the backyard playing with that sling, and his mom said, you're going to kill somebody with that thing in some one of these days. And he did. <laughs> How skilled are you with your Bible? Do, do, do you, 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 that scripture, you don't miss. Goliath is after you. Goliath is throwing spears at you. Goliath wants to take you out. You've got to be skilled with your Bible. You, you, you've got to use, your soul has got to be anchored to the scriptures. You as a Christian have to be anchored to the Holy Bible. This is the word of God. This is not the word of man. It is the word of God. Your soul has got to be anchored to it so that you can overcome Satan's attacks. And you got to be skilled. You've got to anchor other people's soul to the word of God. First Samuel chapter 18. Verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. But had left Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. And everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul gives an order to send a relationship into David's life to take him out. That doesn't work. David's quite humble. And yet the scary thing about Saul is the fact that he threw spears at, at, at David. He tried to, he tried, he tried, he wanted to kill David. He threw spears. You study out the rest of this chapter, he, he picked up a spear and tried to kill him. I believe there are seven spears that are after every single man of God. David was a man of God. He's a man after God's own heart. The Lord was with him. If you are a disciple, the Lord is with you. I say again, if you are a disciple, the Lord is with you. Yes. Stop worrying about the Lord being with you. You be with the Lord. Yes. That, that's the real issue. Is the Lord with, no, the Lord is with you, mighty soldier. You need to be with the Lord. Yes. David understood. Okay, God's with me. I need to be with the Lord right there. And Saul's throwing spears. There are seven spears that are thrown at every Christian. <laughs> seven spears. Spear number one. Darwinism. Darwinism. These are ideas, these are world, these are views that the world teaches that people believe as a mode of living. Government agencies believe in the, these teachings I'm going to talk about. People believe in these teachings. And these men are dead, unlike the uh, Sarte, the existentialist who says God is dead. These men are dead, but they're still throwing spears at you from the grave. Why? Because their teachings are in the universities you go to. Their teachings influence the government you're behind. Their teachings influence everything that's done, and you don't know, you're just living in it, and there's spears coming at this Holy Bible and your faith. And if you're not a man of God, a woman of God, anchored to the Holy Scriptures, you get taken out by one of these people. Darwinism. The theory of evolution. Evolution. Devolution. Uh, basically, I can't get into all of it. You know what it teaches, but it basically teaches that man is progressing. Yeah. Man is not progressing. We are not getting better. We are digressing. We're getting worse. We're getting more and more depraved. We're getting more and more sinful, more rebellious, more angry, more sad, more depressed because our souls aren't anchored to the scriptures. That's a spear after your faith. Darwinism. We're getting better. Mankind is progressing. We're getting, we're more, we're more enlightened now. We're not like back then. That's, this book is old and antiquated. It's, 
We're, we're better. No, you're not. You're, you're, you're more intelligent in your sin. You're, you've invented greater ways to do evil. You've invented... Th- this spirit is after you. This spirit is after you. Karl Marx. Marxism. Still throwing spears at you from the grave. Uh, this may sound, I don't know, preposterous since uh, the fall of communism, uh, Eastern Europe, I'm sure, um, you know, Cold War, uh, that issue, uh, the United States of America, uh, that, that whole deal. Uh, Karl Marx is still influencing things uh, because Karl Marx is, dare we say, um, in his teaching about communism, socialism is wrapped up on in that. Socialism is wrapped up in that. Absolutely. Socialism is a byproduct of communism. Uh, we know Hitler believed in communism. Uh, we, we, we know he believed that non-Europeans were better than those who were not Europeans. Uh, socialism. Uh, just kind of, hey, the government should take care of you. The government has got to look after you. You know, I took the brothers out. We went to Hampstead, and we, 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 we had a great prayer in Hampstead. You go, <coughs> brothers are looking at me like, why are we up here? Well, that's where Karl Marx took him and his family and kind of, Thought about how can I how can I change the world? And he walked around up in Hampstead with his family. And his teaching has changed the world. Economy is in the Bible. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Doesn't say if a man doesn't work, the government's supposed to pay for you and owes you. That ruins the initiative of people and ruins people's drive to do something and to work. First commandment given by God was to work. Wasn't it? Put man in the garden to work. Not put man in the garden and, okay, government, take care of me. It produces victims. Victim mentality is after you. I, the government, you owe me. No, no one owes you anything. We don't, we don't deserve anything. The only thing we're lucky to actually have is the grace of God. And that's only if you respond to it at the waters of baptism and get saved. I'm not mad at any of these people. I wish they would have got saved. I wish Karl Marx would have got saved. I wish he would have got baptized. Game of disciple. <laughs> uh, but but this, is, this is after us. Uh, Julius Wellhausen, German guy. Uh, no feelings towards people from Germany. Amen, Yuri? Uh, but a lot of these teachings came in the 18th and 19th century teachings. Their spears coming after you as a Christian. We need to know them because they influence the world we live in. Uh, he taught religious liberalism. He basically taught, mm, I don't know if we can believe in the whole book of Moses. Mm, there's, I don't know, nah, there's errors in the Bible. Religious liberalism teaches the Bible is not the word of God. There are errors, a problem. And you meet people, yeah, but I don't know if I can really, mm, yeah, there, there's problems in the Bible. I had a debate this week with someone, oh, there's errors in the Bible. The Bible isn't, mm, isn't really the word of God. I go, you know, there was, a, there was a really old philosopher who really had that same teaching. He goes, Really? And he starts naming all these people. I go, no, it's a different philosopher. He goes, who? I go, Satan. (laughs) Genesis chapter (laughs) 3. He's a cranking philosopher. And that was his first strategy. Did God really, is this really the word of God? I found a word that made, most of the Greek and Hebrew words have a bunch of whole different meanings. And you can kind of, you can make the Bible say what you want it to say. And so if you go and find a meaning that most fits your doctrine, which is against God, you can find some Greek or Hebrew word to try and go against the Bible. Yes. Because the words have a bunch of variations. you got to have faith in the word of God. Right. You can't let Wellhausen and religious liberalism and these teachings that are in the universities you go to, that are in the hearts of people that you reach out to, steal your faith. You can't let, it's a spirit. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud. You know what he taught? Another German guy, sorry bro. We got to get to Germany right there. Uh, he says, if it feels good, you need to do it. As long as it feels good. If it feels great, just do it. It's all about feelings. He, he taught, you ever heard psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis? That's where you go in and you meet with some person and you go and you go, I'm I'm down. I'm depressed. I've been been feeling like a dog. Oh, I've been feeling like a dog. And then they go, well, how long have you been feeling like a dog? And you go, ever since I was a puppy. (laughs) (laughs) And and you, (laughs) psychoanalysis is going so deep. 
by how you feel. He basically taught truth is in yourself. No, you meet people that believe the truth is in me. I am the truth. No, you're not. You are the lie. There's no truth in man. There's nothing good in man. There's nothing good in us. We are all sinners and we all need the grace of God. We all need the Lord right there. Sigmund Freud is throwing spears at people, making them think truth is in themselves. A way to protect yourself from actually being hurt by God. You have an unholy fear of God. You don't have a righteous, godly fear of God. God wants to protect you. God loves you. God made you. God created you in his image. You are made in the image of God. He didn't create the sun in the image of God. He didn't create the moon in the image of God. He created you in the image of God. God loves you. Don't you let any psych- so any psychologist, any man tell you that God doesn't love and yearn to protect you. He is awesome. He is your father. Doesn't matter how you were raised. He is the perfect dad. John Dewey, American philosopher. It's another spear being thrown at us. Uh, he taught experience is truth. The truth is what you've experienced. Now, if we put, if we say truth is experience, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. Last guy, John Keynes. Well, last two guys. John Keynes. He taught that government is God. He taught Keynesian economics. After the Great Depression. Uh, he taught Keynesian ec- economics is going to get the... Uh, basically, K- Keynesian economics says, hey, give all the money to the government and the government will take care of you. Government is God. You don't need God, you need the government. You don't need God, you need the government. Government is... That's what a lot of people believe. They don't need God. They need a government... The government will fix it all up. The government, as long as we have the right government in place, give us all your money. You go to America, they're in a free fall spending as if the government can deal with the real issue, which is sin. The real issue isn't having an awesome government, it's sin. And unless we deal with sin, we are in trouble. Keynes taught that it was the government that was the issue and not the sins of the people that led to the Great Depression. All the greed and all that stuff that led to the Great Depression. Last guy is Kirkgaard, he's a Danish guy. He taught confusion is everywhere and truth is subjective. Whatever is true for you is true for you, is true for you, true for you. Truth is, truth is subjective. It's, 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 not, it's not absolute. John chapter 17, verse 17 says the word of God is truth. It's absolute. Amen. He said, uh, Kirkgaard taught that illicit sex is not right or wrong. It's just a matter of what you feel. Mm-hmm. Whatever you feel, if it feels good for you, awesome. Oh, you like boys. You're an adult man. You like boys. Oh, you're part of NAMBLA. National Alliance of Man-Boy Alliance in America. Oh, wow, that's great. Mm, That's amazing. Go ahead and try to erase the laws that put statutory rape in place, and let's get rid of that. Because if a kid is 13 years old and he feels in love with a grown man, that's okay. Mm. Homosexuality is okay. Disney is now putting homosexuality in their TV shows. If it feels right, it must be okay. I was born gay. Well, you can be born again. Have you been hit by one of those seven spears? You need faith in the word of God to overcome. Chapter 19. Let's bring it in for a close here. Verse 1. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and you and will tell you what I find. Of course, he warns David. And then we come to a very, very interesting point in chapter 19 and verse 17. He warns David and then David is laying down asleep. And and it says in verse 17 of chapter 19, Saul said to McCall, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? And you go, well, what did she do? Well, what she did is when David, when the men came to get David, she put an idol in the place of where David was sleeping. And so when they pulled David back to get him, there was an idol there. Now, this was McCall, the woman married to David. Question's got to be asked, what's the woman after, who's married to a man after God's own heart doing with an idol in her house? <coughs> what is she doing with an idol in her home? What's he doing? Allowing her to have that idol in the home. 
Are you with me here? We can't let these idols be in our homes. There's so much meat in First and Second Samuel. It says in verse 18, When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth of Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Verse 22 it says, So Saul went to Naoth of Ramah, but... And he walked among the prop, uh, walked along prophesying till he came to Naoth. He stripped off his robes and also prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay that way all that day and night. This is why the people say it's Saul also among the prophets. Chapter 20. Then David fled to Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? Why have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. See, Jonathan's out of touch. He said, you're not going to die. He didn't realize he's going to die by not joining David. And this one is very, 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 very powerful because in chapter 20, verse 42, David realizes he has to leave. And it says, Jonathan said to him, go in peace. For we have sworn friendship with each other. Name the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left Jonathan and went back to town. You need friends in the kingdom. You need friends in the kingdom. Now, it says, later on it says, uh, David wept. When he and Jonathan realized that Saul wouldn't repent. And it says Saul and Jonathan, or Saul and David, or David and Jonathan wept. But the Bible says David wept the most. Why? Because Jonathan never joined him. He never joined him. And in the end, he was taken out along with his father. Jonathan believed something, and this is our close that relationship supersedes conviction. But we know conviction supersedes relationship. What you believe, the word of God supersedes relationship. See, Jonathan thought, well, you know, I got a great relationship with my my, my dad. I'm going to win him over and he's going to stop pursuing you. But in that, he got taken up. Because he believed his relationship with his father would be able to be influenced. Because he thought he just would be able to do it. he, He couldn't. Do you believe your conviction on the word of God supersedes relationships? Do you believe your conviction on the word of God determines relationships? Do you believe your conviction on the word of God establishes relationships? We're all here together because of the word of God. It's the word of God that's brought us together. Satan will go after you and he will put you in a position where you got to choose the scriptures or relationship. Yeah. And if you choose relationship over scripture, you can end up like Jonathan. I think the reason why David wept the most is because David knew it. David knew it. Uh, He he knew what Jonathan was doing. It didn't happen right away. It was roughly about 10 years later where Jonathan actually dies. But he knew it. I'll never forget our former fellowship. I remember brothers looking me in the eye and going, I'm going to go a different way. And I see where they are now. Those who've walked away from God. I see the individuals. I see their pictures on Facebook. I see them drunk. I see them putting up posts and things that are so ungodly. I see the sadness there. It it frightens me. I look through 1 Samuel and I look at the fact that McCall, Saul's daughter, learned all her deceit from her father. She lies and uses idols. She learned all that from her dad. And I, I, it scares me. I go, I don't want my kids learning evil from me. That's Do not want that. I want to be a man after God. I got to put my faith in the word of God and conquer these giants. Amen. And yet we, we, we see that we live in a time where relationships are so strained at times and people aren't close when they finally get one. They're so afraid of losing it. They, they will sacrifice what they believe for the relationship. Yeah. And you've got to allow your faith in God to be stronger. 
You got to let your convictions determine your destiny. Yes. You got to let your convictions determine your destiny. Chapter 21, we close here. David's in exile for 10 years. And he's now on the run. He's he's been pursued. He's on the run. And here he writes Psalm chapter 7, Psalm chapter 11, Psalm 16, Psalms 22, Psalms 25, Psalms 31. But he also writes Psalms 22 verse 1 because he's being pursued by Saul. And Saul is a type of antichrist as well. He's a type of Satan. He's like a shadow of Satan pursuing you, going after you. It it, it doesn't so much here. I mean, David is the disciple. Saul is the non-disciple. He's the the enemy going, pursuing David for no reason. Satan's after you for no reason. He just just doesn't want you to believe. He doesn't want you to make it. Because he knows in the end, his time is short. And so these 10 years, David's in exile. He writes these Psalms. David actually quotes Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. David quotes that psalm as he is on the run. Um, We'll read verse 21 here. Or chapter 21. I'm sorry, it's actually chapter 22, the cave of Adelon. Chapter 22. Come on, Michael. Yeah, there it is, verse 1. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adelon. That's where he wrote all those psalms. When his brothers and his fathers and his household heard about it, they all went down to him there. All those who were in distress, in debt, or discontented gathered around him, he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. Him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? We stop right there. I mean, David goes to, he's on the run. He goes to the, to the cave of Adam. Uh And, I mean, he had to be down. He had to be depressed. He had to be sad. And the Bible just says 400 guys gathered around him and he became their leader. Everybody's bitter and angry and got issues and attitudes. And David, what are we going to do about this? David's like, hold on, let me sort myself out and then try to do something. And I think David's soul was anchored to the word of God. He wrote Psalms. He wrote Psalms while he was in that cave. You know, as a Christian, you will, you'll be, there'll be times where you're in a cave. But when your soul is anchored to the word of God, you'll climb out of that cave. That cave may be there to produce Psalms in your heart. That's where David wrote most of his Psalms. There we say the light shines brightest where it's darkest. Where it's darkest. And David at his darkest moment, he writes Psalms. He wrote Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. Of course, that one says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know who said that, right? He wrote Psalms 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. We know who said that, right? He wrote those while he was here in the cave of Adelaide. Isn't that awesome to see the shadow of Jesus in David? Yet God longs to see the shadow of Jesus in you. He longs for that. He, he, your sufferings aren't just, don't waste the hurts you go through. Don't give up on the Lord. That's right. But don't waste them. Write psalms in your heart. God is producing songs that you will be able to sing someday. And you'll be able to talk about the victories, how you fought for your faith, how you overcame Goliath with the word. You let people in your life. You did it. You fought. You struggled to get your 20 times mission contribution. But you had the faith. You did it. You were in the cave, but you came out fighting. You didn't give up, get depressed, fall away for a few weeks, get mad at the church, and then come back. Like a lot of people, let me fall away, find some problem with the church, and then come back. All of a sudden, magically, da 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 No. Uh-uh. Keep your faith in the word of God. Faith in God. Conquers giants. Let's blow out our 20 times mission contribution. We got to blow it out, guys. It's time that we start having some radical miracles in the church, baptisms in the church. Believe that God's power can baptize people, everybody. Believe that Polish people can become disciples. Believe that English people can become disciples. Believe that Irish people can become disciples. Believe that Irish people can become disciples. And believe that Americans become disciples. Believe that Indians can become disciples. Believe Asians become disciples. Put your faith in the word of God, which says, with God, all things are possible. To God be all the glory.